O master from the mountainside, make haste to heal these hearts of pain. Among these restless throngs abide, O tread the city's streets again, till sons of men shall learn thy love and follow where thy feet have trod, till glorious from thy heavens above shall come the city of our God. In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. One summer, Ellen, the children, and I traveled up to Manhattan to visit with our cousins, and one of our cousins was kind enough to put us up in a very fancy hotel. Upon our arrival, he explained to us, when you check into the hotel, they're going to give you some vouchers to the restaurant, one of the restaurants that's in the hotel, and you've got to check it out. You are going to love it. Great, I said. Fantastic. What's the name of the restaurant? He responded, well, it, it, it doesn't actually have a name, but, but when you find the neon sign with the hamburger on it, you'll know that you have arrived. I said, okay, well, what floor is it on? Oh, it's on the first floor. You can get to it through the lobby. You just go beyond the check-in desk. You'll find a woman who's at a podium. Go behind her. There's a curtain. Go through it down the hall, and there you'll see the neon sign. Now, as my cousin was explaining this, I was trying to build a mental model in my mind to, to, to picture what this would look like, but I was starting to get confused. I said, is it, do, do you pass by the, the curtain and then you find the woman at the podium, or is the woman at the podium and, and, and then the curtain and then the hallway? And he said, oh, don't worry about it. Just ask someone and they'll show you where it is. And he sped off to a meeting. But I was left to wonder, how do you ask about a restaurant that doesn't have a name? Well, eventually, we did find it. And as soon as we passed through the door, under that neon hamburger sign, the effect was like magic. Because we were transported from the formal setting of this upscale hotel with its modern, chic design into a restaurant that had been decorated like the quintessential college hamburger dive. Every detail was there. There was graffiti on the walls. There were posters advertising an upcoming concert at a fraternity. There's a, the, the sign showing um, the basics uh, of the menu and just the basics. But it was really magic. And while the burgers and the fries and the milkshakes were great, it was clear that a major part of the restaurant's allure was the fact that it was mysterious and hidden. It didn't have a name. You had to know where to find the door. And once you had found it and passed through it, you were transported into another world. It was a very clever effect. Well, our Lord Jesus spoke about a very similar door, a door that is hidden and not easy to find, a door that leads into another world. Strive to enter by the narrow door, Jesus said. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Now, this passage about the narrow door, it comes from Luke chapter 13, which was not assigned for us this morning, but it is the context for our passage that was assigned today. Because here in Luke chapter 14, Jesus has been invited to a dinner, and he's trying to help both the guests and the host find the narrow door, which is currently obscured from their view. He wants to help them find that narrow door so that they can enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus uses that term all the time, kingdom of God, but what on earth does it mean? Well, when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, he's talking about any and every place where he is Lord and King. But you might say, if Jesus is, in fact, God, then is he not Lord and King of everywhere? And, and the answer is, well, on one level, no, he is not. Because, you see, God has given us all a choice to make. Will we submit our lives to Jesus or not? Will we make him the king in here or not? 
And until we do, we are standing outside the door to the kingdom. Now, as for that Manhattan restaurant, the door was hidden by design. It was a kind of gimmick to make those who entered feel like they were in on some great big secret. And it was a lot of fun. But the narrow door into the kingdom of God is not hidden and narrow by God's design. No, what makes that door to the kingdom narrow is our unwillingness to pass through it. Because we know that to pass through it is to place our lives under the kingship of Jesus. And what makes that door so hard to find are our own sinful and rebellious hearts which cloud our view so that we cannot see it. But Jesus wants to show us the way. He wants to show us how to find the narrow door, to teach us how to walk through it, if only we are willing. And that is what today's encounter here in Luke chapter 14 is all about. When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. Now, on the face of it, it seems like Jesus is just offering some good practical advice for the next time that you get invited to a wedding feast. But remember, Jesus is trying to help these people find the narrow door into the kingdom of God. So it's a parable about something going on in here, the human heart. He's trying to address a problem a problem that he wants to expose so that these persons will be able to see the narrow door and walk through it. Think about your own experience and observation. What would motivate a person to want to put themselves in the metaphorical place of honor or head of the line or at the head of the table? Generally, it's one of two things, and both of them will keep a person from finding the narrow door into the kingdom. First, there are those of us who choose the place of honor because we think that we deserve it. We believe that we are entitled to it. But a man will never find the narrow door of the kingdom if he thinks he's entitled to it. Bishop N.T. Wright had such a beautiful way of expressing this spiritual truth. Listen to the picture that he paints. He says, pride is the great cloud which blots out the sun of God's generosity. Pride is the great cloud which blots out the sun of God's generosity. And he goes on. If I reckon that I deserve to be favored by God, not only do I declare that I don't need his grace, mercy, and love, but I imply that those who don't deserve it should not have it. Friends, the door to the kingdom of God can only be found once we become painfully aware that we do not deserve to walk through it. That's why Jesus, in his loving mercy, is confronting these dinner guests and challenging them to make a sober self-assessment. Am I presuming to be worthy? Is my pride blinding me from seeing my desperate need for God's grace? Do I understand why Jesus is telling me that my proper place is the very same seat that is occupied by the vilest offender, the lowest seat? Friends, we cannot enter through the narrow door with our pride intact. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. So that's the first hindrance to the kingdom that Jesus is addressing, the heart which believes that it is entitled to the seat of honor. But there's a second problem of the heart which will drive a man to grasp after the place of honor, and it's almost the opposite of the first. Whereas the first man takes that chair because he believes that he deserves it, the second man grasps after the place of honor because deep down inside he knows he's not worthy of it. But there's a voice inside that tells him, a voice that tells him that if he can grasp it, if he can just score that position at work, 
if he can achieve that rank, if he can hit that sales marker, buy that car, or obtain that house, or get his kids into that school, then, then he will be able to prove to himself and to the world that he is worthy of the place of honor. One of the most powerful cinematic depictions of this heart condition is the character P.T. Barnum in the movie The Greatest Showman. If you haven't seen it, I, I would commend it to you. It's a fun movie, but there's also um, great depth to it as well. Barnum comes from humble beginnings and a humble um, start, a humble household, but he marries the daughter of a wealthy man. And his father-in-law seems to take pleasure in reminding Barnum that he is nothing but the son of a tailor. And so Barnum sets out on a mission to prove to his father-in-law and to the world that he is a man worthy of the place of honor. Each Barnum show, each Barnum production is bigger than the last, but it doesn't make a difference. Barnum never seems to arrive at the place of peace. And when the film reaches its climax, there's a moment of textbook dramatic irony. If I were an English teacher, I would use this to illustrate dramatic irony because we, the audience, and everyone in Barnum's life, we realize, we see what Barnum is doing. We see him grasping for the place of honor. And when a famous European singer takes the stage, her song gives voice to what everyone but Barnum can see. All the shine of a thousand spotlights, all the stars we steal from the night sky will never be enough. Never be enough. Towers of gold are still too little. These hands could hold the world, but it'll never be enough. Never be enough. It's a song about Barnum. Barnum, who is grasping for the place of honor through fame and fortune in an effort to feel worthy and significant. But friends, it's also a song about some of us here today. It's a song about those of us who are striving after all notion of things in an effort to silence that voice which says, you are not worthy of the place of honor. You're nothing but the son of a tailor. Friends, if that's you, Jesus says, go and sit at the lowest place, yes, so that when your host comes, when I come to you, I may say to you, friend, move higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Yes, Jesus is saying, you, you are unworthy of the place of honor, but you will never establish your true worth by what you accomplish, by what you achieve, by what you possess. It will never, ever be enough. You cannot achieve the place of honor by grasping it. But if you will only walk through the narrow door of faith, if you will only take the lowest seat by surrendering to me, then you will discover your true worth when you see what you mean to me, when you see what I have done for you. When you see that I have given my life for you on the cross. Friends, what about you? Have you been seeking after the place of honor through your career or your possessions, through your accolades or the achievements of your children? It'll never be enough. But if you enter by the narrow door, Jesus will show you your infinite worth to God. And you will finally have peace. Well, having exposed what keeps us from finding the narrow door, Jesus then begins to paint a picture of what it lo looks like once we have passed through it. He turns to his host and he says this. He says, when you give a dinner or banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, 
Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. Now, again, on the face of it, it might seem like Jesus is just giving some advice for a very occasional event. After all, even the most social of us, uh, we do not throw dinner parties each and every week. And while we don't want to ignore the challenge that Jesus has presented us for the next time that we invite someone over for dinner, the truth is what he is saying here has a much broader implication for each and every one of us. Once you pass through the narrow door of the kingdom, once you invite Jesus to become king over every aspect of your life, he will then begin to show you how to imitate him. He will show you how to imitate him in every aspect of your life. And what has Jesus done for us? We who are unworthy to gather up the crumbs under the table, his table, what has he done for us? What has he done for us, we who are spiritually poor and crippled and lame and, yes, blind? What has he done for us? And what has he done for us, we who cannot repay him? Friends, he has given his life for us on the cross so that we might be given a place of honor in the household of the living God as sons and daughters of God. That is what he has done for us. And so Jesus, our king, he turns to us through this passage and he says, you, my people, you go and do likewise. Friends, who in your life is metaphorically poor, crippled, lame, blind? Who, who in your life is unable to repay you? Or put another way, who is beholden to you? Who is beneath you? Who cannot further your career, return any favor of any sort? Several weeks ago, I sat in as the guest of one of our Bible studies. It's a Bible study that meets at a nearby restaurant. And they've been meeting at this restaurant for years. The guys were chatting before the study got started. And when the waiter walked up, they paused their conversation and they turned their attention to the waiter and they greeted him by name. It was clear, even from their brief conversation, that they'd gotten to know each other, this group and their waiter. As he pulled out his pen and his pad to start taking our orders, he shared that he was planning to move on in a few weeks and that the guys wouldn't be seeing him anymore. Well, that got their attention. And they began to ask him all sorts of questions about what was next for him. Their questions had a way of drawing him in. It, it was clear that the, the waiter received these questions as their care and concern for him. Well, after explaining what was next for him, the waiter said something that I doubt I will ever forget because it cut me to the heart. He said, I just want you guys to know how much your group has meant to me. He motioned back to the kitchen as other waiters were coming and going, and he said, we don't like to work on Sundays, I have to tell you, because the church crowd is really unkind to us. They're rude and demanding. They treat us like we're nobodies. But you all are different. I don't know, but, but it seems to me, I, I think you guys are what Christians are supposed to be. Now, as you can imagine, as I was sitting there as a guest in my, you know, black clerical shirt, my little collar, I felt simultaneously ashamed for what happened on Sundays, but immensely proud of what had clearly been happening Friday by Friday by Friday as these men gathered around the table to study the Word of God. The Sunday crowd and the Friday crowd. Which of these two were living out our Lord's admonition to his host on this occasion here in Luke chapter 14? When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. 
Friends, every day we encounter persons who are beholden to us in some way, who cannot repay us for our kindness. But once you pass through the narrow door, once you begin to see what Jesus has done for you, then you begin to hear his call as your Lord and King to do unto them as he has done to you. To invite them into the feast of your life by your kindness, your gracious courtesy, your Christ-like care. What does life look like once you pass through the narrow door? Well, it looks a lot like Jesus. Who, though being worthy of the place of honor, seated himself in the place of shame on the cross so that a narrow door might be open for us. A door that leads into the house of the Father where a table has been set for you. May God grant us the grace to take that kingdom, that lordship of Jesus, and give it away to all those who cannot repay. Go, my friends, and do likewise. Let us pray. Our Lord Jesus, we thank you that by your death on the cross, by taking the lowest place, you have opened the narrow door for us. Grant us the grace, we pray, to forsake our pride, to forsake our grasping after the seat of honor, and to step into your kingdom, and in turn, to take that kingdom out to be a blessing to those who cannot repay. Lord, that me might uh, represent you. For we ask these things in your precious and powerful name. Amen.